according to the cloud. This is week 14, part two, which is the most important part, most fun part, um, most meaningful part, because I'm not going to talk as much. We're going to hear from our guest, who is an alum of the IST program. In fact, she is one of the first EDD graduates, if not the first. I'm, mm, I think I am. So we do have the first. So she can tell us what the Rocky Road was like at the very beginning. So you can all learn from her, not mistakes, but her pathway that she took. So Gina Anderson is now with Luma Brighter, Luna Brighter Learning. She's the CEO and founder, and she's been doing many things in the past before that, in addition to almost being a professional tennis player, um, mm -hmm. and now is almost a professional runner um, for, in her spare time with her husband. I don't know if they have competition. Like you. I think you're our competition. I, I don't mean, think you've been running, so. You've been running for years nonstop. I, I at least took a break. Like tonight, I didn't run. Did you run today? Just now. I just finished half hour ago. See? 45 minutes ago. So, yeah. I was hurting coming back from a conference. I was <laughs> hurting. Literally, you know, it's hard. You don't get much sleep and your body's so sore, you know, running after that. You just, you look. I oh, know you need a break. I look like a hundred year old man out there. Um, so, <laughs> uh, or a robot, I don't know which. So Gina, I've given people your bio. I've given uh, a little bit of information. You can see that Luma's uh, won awards, um, several uh, awards in the past couple of years, 2021 and 2022, most customer friendly, um, the most innovative company. So best company of the year awards. It sounds like you're providing a motivational environment, which is the topic for tonight. Uh, uh, creating the structures for people to want to perform better. So uh, having an environment where people want to learn more to, so they can contribute more in turn, right? And so um, Gina's got a doctorate in, of education in IST from IU Bloomington, a... Um, Certificate in Learning Media and Technology and a minor in Learning Sciences. She's got her bachelor's ed from Dayton, not too far away, University Go Flyers. of Flyers. Really good place to be, lovely campus. Always new buildings going up and around that campus. It's true. Yep. And so she's created a couple uh, books and games. Maybe you could talk about those in, during this hour. Uh, one is building learning communities to con connect learners remotely, strategies for building learning communities at a distance in trucking. Keep on trucking. My mm -hmm. name, Kurt, backwards is truck, by the way. Uh, oh, fun fact. <laughs> That's a fun fact. Don't, don't spell I'll bonk I have to remember backwards. that. I know don't I got in trouble. I got, got in trouble for that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Luma, Lumify tips, the game-based tips to engage drivers. Teaching without a teaching degree, available on Amazon 106 teaching tips for individuals without a teaching degree. Uh, so she's won Women in Business Awards as well, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. If you want to give it to somebody else for change. I don't know. They're they're I'm starting to dominate there. I gotta let someone else win this year. I think. You do. You you just mm. gotta, you know, you just please the competitor in me though. I don't know. A high need for achievement. So we have an example of some of the high need for achievement with us was a topic for tonight. I could go on oh. and on, you know, but I guess you should give us a little bit more of your history and how you ebbed and flowed and how you eventually got to this path and coming to IST as a, you know, because you had many other places you could go. And she also worked for the University of Illinois system, the global campus back when they were ramping mm -hmm. up and putting courses online about to 15 20 years mm -hmm. ago it was a long time ago mm -hmm. yeah it was almost 20 years ago it was yeah it's someone i had lunch with on friday unbe lee and i had lunch together Aww. how's she so, doing good yeah. hi unbe if you listen to this she sometimes does actually and um she sometimes comes to this one i'll have to send her um the link mm -hmm. um, she's in back in korea at kyung hee university and has a couple of kids there and um Got her degree in Georgia. Her sister got her degree at Indiana, and her brother-in-law got his degree at Indiana. Both yes. students, I saw 
Dabe present yesterday just before jumping in a taxi on AI and math. Oh, so, oh got it. Yeah. Super excited about AI. It's going to bring that to Luma in the next quarter. So yeah, we can yeah. chat about that too. Hey, let's start with something totally uh, different. Yeah. Can you answer people and tell people why did the University of Illinois online or global campus fail? And, and what was your role in it? Well, I didn't, I didn't have anything to do with it failing. Let's just throw that out there. You know, it's interesting from my perspective. So I was the lead instructional designer for their programs. Um, their nursing program, by the way, which I helped design is still being used at UIC campus. So they actually split up the programs and uh, distributed them among the campus. I think one of the main perspectives that I saw for it not working is that they didn't have um, the leadership all on the same page about their goals and objectives. And so if you have somebody, if you have leaders at a company that are not on the same page about what they want in terms of the ultimate goal, then you don't have all the same vision for what the end game is or the business strategy. Um, and you're now you're trying to talk about bringing across um, a new business model for a university that may have a different perspective on how to run a business. Um, and those those perspectives clashed. And so, you know, it was kind of the undoing of the campus of not being able to collaborate and align your business objectives. Um, that's one thing to learn if you're going to start your own business and have leadership be part of it. You all have to be on the same page. So it wasn't the programs. Um, it was more of a, a kind of an alignment of objectives from all the campuses agreeing on what they wanted to do with it and where that money was going to be funneled. So that that's my perspective on it. So she should have been running the University of Illinois Global Campus. As you can tell from her answer, if she had been running it, it might still exist today. Maybe. Do yeah, you know maybe. That I'm the reason they created it. You're the reason they created it? Did you go pitch them? You went down and you pitched it? I'm just sort of in jest telling you this, but in yeah. 1998, 1999, in particular 99, they, ha they had gone to the faculty of Illinois with this um, move to move things online and the faculty rebelled for a bit. And so they said, well, yeah. we'll, we'll create a class in effect. We'll get these experts together at Illinois of our you know, best faculty from Chicago campus, Springfield and here in, in Champaign and others. And we'll hold a weekly forum and in, in, in seminar. And they brought in different people in 15 weeks. And I was one of the people they brought in. Got it. And they did this major report uh, for the whole campus. And uh, you know what that report was called? I don't know, you do tell real, me. The real bonk creator. Report. What was it? The bonk report. You're close. Yeah, you're really close. You're one word off. Um, you know, I have a first name. Curtis, the Curtis Report. Well, no, but I was, oh. I was, I was leading you the wrong way. Um, so they actually have a report and they're creative in Illinois. You know, they're so darn creative. They, they have, you know, they got nothing else to do. It's just a flat land anyways, you know, in Illinois. So they, they you know what they call the report? The report. Got it. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> from the then they had a colon and then they had all this long stuff after the colon but yeah uh, but yeah. anyways so that that was a, that was we led them on the trail to nowhere but it, it got somewhere <laughs> in terms of nursing but this is what happens well, the at, nursing uh, program is still rated in the top of the country and um yeah. you know you all talk about motivation i came in you know at the very end of the last part but truly you know and it kind of leads into kind of our conversation together i think is that program is motivating because it taps into the potential of people engaging it in different ways. And so you kind of meet, you kind of get where your needs are and meeting it, um, whether it's asynchronous, synchronous, different modalities and modes of learning and that program does it. So go nursing program, uh, yeah. it's an outstanding program. So yeah. I'm glad you had a part in that. That's where we met, by the way. So I was just introducing that. <laughs> That's where Jean and I met. And then, of course, she was down here at first in the PhD program and then moving over and cycling into the EDD program. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you want to tell people a little bit about your journey, beyond because she had started a business with her husband in South Bend, Indiana, but are now in Charleston, South Carolina. Yes. And so tell us about that 
transition yeah. and, and, and the, the stuff I missed in your bio. Yeah, definitely. Well, anyone that um, is interested in connecting with me certainly can if you have questions about um, any any anything particular we talk about today, and I'll be sure to give you my contact information. Um, but in essence, my passion really started with being a special education teacher. So I started my career as a special ed teacher, and um, I loved working with the children and, and really helping them learn. And my interest in studying how people learn and really tapping into to that area was because I once taught somebody how to tie a shoe that they said never would be able to do anything like that. And so I had cross categorical, this was, you know, decades ago, but I had, I had an elementary and a special ed degree. So they had me assisting myself in a classroom. So I got to do a lot of different things and be creative. And so that really motivated me to go back and get my master's. Um, and I went to the University of Dayton to get that. And while I was there, they invited me um, to actually train their faculty um, on how to teach. Because when I was a classroom teacher, there weren't uh, there was only one computer in our school uh, and I was the teacher that had it. So I just kind of immersed myself in technology. So I ended up um, through that journey at Dayton, they hired me to be their director of online learning. Um, and through that time, I was going around to different universities and sharing how to do technology enhanced learning <clears throat> online and blended uh, at different universities. And so I started a consulting business where I would go to universities and suggest how they build their programs. Um, and through that experience, I realized that I had a lot more to learn. So I applied for my PhD program at Indiana University, and I actually got in and was a chancellor fellow there um, while I was there face to face. And I was physically there on campus. Um, there were circumstances while I was there, I decided to actually leave. And I actually had a lot of opportunity to do more consulting and, um, and, and so forth. So I decided that it really probably wasn't a good time. The EDD program actually came around at an awesome time because it met my needs. You guys talk about needs. I could work and I could do what I was doing, which was starting a business and I could finish my doctoral degree. So I had all the coursework done face to face, but then I finished online. Um, but at my time at University of Dayton, I had Dr. Bonk come and speak to the faculty there because there was a lot of resistance to go online at that time. Um, and so, you know, trying to get the whole faculty as the director of online learning to, to embrace online education was an uh, interesting feat. Um, but through my journey doing that, I saw a real opportunity to, to, re to start a company uh, I had I was I was really busy developing all these online programs, um, and so we had an office right across from Notre Dame. I'm not a Notre Dame fan, so if you are, uh, I had to pretend like I was because our office overlooked the Notre Dame Stadium. So people like to come to our office to see the Notre Dame football. Exactly. Uh, if you share this with anyone, I do love Notre Dame. You know, I know this is going to go online, but. Um, in all seriousness, there was a company that was next door to us and we were building Notre Dame's online learning programs. And they knocked on our door and they were like, you guys are doing some really cool stuff. They're like, can you help us build safety training? And I was like, like what kind of safety training? And they said, train truck drivers. And I thought to myself, hmm, uh, how are they training currently? And they said, well, go out and observe how truck drivers are trained. Do you guys know how truck drivers are trained? Does anyone on the... You guys all know, see a lot of truck drivers, right? All these semi-trucks and Amazon drivers. Does anyone know how they're trained? No, no one has any ideas. Well, here, here's the thing. They're not trained very well. It's not aligned, aligned how people learn. Um, they're basically, I went out and observed hours and hours and hours and hours of onboarding truck drivers. And you'd be horrified how a truck driver is trained and put into a vehicle and put on the road to drive goods all over the country. They drive all the time, they're under a lot of stress. It's a high pressure job and they're put in a truck and they're not trained very well. And so I helped a company build their safety training. And what I found was that the drivers were super engaged and um, in essence, we were helping them be safer on the road. So I saw a real opportunity to go full-time into trucking because higher ed, they have people like Dr. Bonk and they have uh, companies and faculty that really feel strongly about how people learn. 
Um, and which is, you know, it is what it is, but they have whole departments doing this and the companies that are in that space in higher ed do everything. They do marketing, they do, um, you know, onboarding, they do, they do, they're like a whole shop. And for us, Luma, we're a learning company. So we focus on how adults learn and we take analytics um, to, to gather that information in terms of learning preferences. And I did my doctoral research on nurses which is actually what I found is different than truck drivers. Um, and so we started creating a learning environment for truck drivers and we found, and this is why we've been winning a lot of awards because our, our method and what we do for the industry is we create a lot of different ways of motivating the drivers and different mediums and modes of learning, which they don't do in trucking. They put them in a classroom for four days and they lecture to them. And then they, they, you know they're not retaining that information because we know it's cognitive overload and it's very skills-based. And then they're put in a truck and they're told to go drive the truck. And so it's, it's, it's horrific um, of what they're doing. And we are the only learning company in, in the industry currently that offers a, a solution that includes instructional design to help them build authentic learning experiences for the drivers in, in different modes and different modalities um, and, and really meet them where their learning needs are at. Because you can imagine, not everyone, but the population that goes into trucking to drive, um, some of them have learning challenges. And so we really have to help them meet those learning challenges and motivation. I, um, if you go to our website, I did a uh, radio show of trucking, but last week I was on the radio and um, talking to the drivers and you talk about motivation. I mean, look at texting and driving. How many of you see people texting and driving? I hope none of you text and drive. I mean, if you close your eyes, close your eyes and count eight seconds. Now think about that when you're driving. That's the average time that people are spending looking at their phones, looking at your phone and not having it on the road. Think about a semi doing that, a semi driver. They kill people. There, I mean, there's people killed every day because they're texting and driving in semis. Probably, I mean, and everything but semis. Um, and so this month, April is distracted driving month. Um, and so I'm really trying to reach the drivers and, and what motivates them? Why are they, why are they looking at their phones and what can we do to tap into the, you know, the motivational theory so that we can help them and change their behavior? Cause look, it's not about them not knowing that they shouldn't text and drive. Everyone knows you shouldn't text and drive. It's not like you don't know that it's not a cognitive retention thing. It's a behavior change that we have to do because it's life or death. Um, so I know I got off track, but I'm like really passionate about it because we see these horrific drive cam videos of drivers killing people because they're looking at their cell phones. Yeah, let me interrupt here for a second. I, we didn't get any clarity on that um, distracted driving month. Does that mean we're supposed to be distracted this month and drive or we're supposed I to? I hope work? not. Please don't. <laughs> Please don't. There's a, there's a, uh, there's so, a study. Yeah, go ahead. My there's a study what that shows no it shows that the drivers when you look at like the eight seconds that you had your eyes closed yeah i mean that's an average time of people how much time people look and they don't realize it's just it's eight seconds that's a long at 60 time. miles an hour that's a long time well with a um, semi that yeah. weighs you yeah. know but i'm not i mean it, it happens with anyone everyone everyone sees people texting and driving but that yeah, right. is just it's terrible I had a nephew who had a tr tr truck driver's license and in the first week he killed somebody. Uh, really? So, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. It's, yeah. Real. It's, it's real, it's real, it's real. Yeah. I mean, it's thing, it's like, what's great, it's great with what we do is like, we create training that saves people's lives. I mean, it's really like what you're studying, if what you're doing, like you're getting these degrees, it's not just about studying it. It's about taking it and putting it in practice to change people's lives. Like what you guys are doing and learning from Dr. Bonk, I mean, can change your life and can change other people's lives. And so being motivated and having, having the wherewithal and the confidence to take what you learn 
back to practice and make a difference is really what it's about. Well, I told my department chair, she says, what's a through line of your research? Says, Life change with technology. So we're studying kids in Nepal who are taking MOOCs to learn English. Who, it might help them get into college in the U.S. It's life change. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, whatever. exactly. So using open education resources, open textbooks, all this stuff, free and open stuff. Anyways, it's about life change, really. But I, I, I want to point out, Gina, for a little bit, we have pro your internet was going in and out. We got everything. It did catch up. But just to be aware, you might, it, it, you're fine now, but it might be something we might have to reboot, but it's, it seems fine. Um, I would point out a couple other things. On the wall behind Gina is two IU certificates. So um, so going back to the motivation, is it is it extrinsic or intrinsic? And you mentioned this earlier. It's about you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs having a purpose, having, you know, something you're striving towards, having goals and so forth. It's high order needs, right? Um, so, so yeah. And, and um, I'll also point out you are a Chancellor's Fellow. We no longer have Chancellor's Fellows, at least that I'm aware of. Um, a lot of that oh, funding, really? Yeah, a lot of that funding's gone. We're pretty much SOL in terms of funding for doctoral <laughs> students these days. We might have oh, one no. or two. Oh, yeah, it's been next to nothing. Um, uh, Notre Dame, I always want to play football for Notre Dame, but I don't care now. So if you can talk bad about them, it's okay with me. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's just a couple of things. So you got a master's in instructional tech from Dayton, as well as an undergraduate from Dayton, as well as a doctorate at IU. Mm -hmm. and, a, and a certificate, I think, along the way, too. Mm -hmm. a couple yeah, of them, learning like, science. Mm -hmm. Learning science, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, you've covered a lot of territory. But mm -hmm. we, we need to go back to these books that you've done on building learning communities is an mm -hmm. important 2023. It's brand new. I have one. Right so here. show us the books that you've done and the card game that you've done. I, I think I got a copy of the card game. It's done in my home office. I do. Yep. Um, yep. So this is the one of the books I can send you. My one on Amazon, I sent it to someone so I don't have it on my bookshelf. Um, but really what we're doing for the industry. So people ask me, like, what's the deal with the characters? Um, truck drivers won't really get into that. It looks like elementary, but it gets their attention. The first step, obviously, we know of learning is getting someone's attention. And, and Nugget is what uh, my mascot's name because we do micro lessons. Um, and the book on building community of learners, do you ever think that they ask drivers to learn from each other? Never. What do, you, what do you think, Jennifer? Well, I um, when you first asked how they were trained, my guess was they had um, some sort of ride along or something. But I guess I'm wrong based on what you've said so far. Yeah, so there are some carriers that do to do um, train the trainer, so they have drivers in the truck with them. Um, so they there are carriers that do that, but not a lot of them. I mean, they they learn alone, isolated through an instructor. And what we found with America Service Lines was that drivers, obviously like any adult learner are gonna appreciate the knowledge that they bring. You have drivers that are driven for 30 years. No one's ever asked them like, you know, how do you, how do you unhook your trailer? I mean, it's such an opportunity to do learner to learner, building learner remote, remotely the drivers because they're all over the country, all over the world. I mean, they're all over the world. And so this book that I wrote um, provides the carriers strategies. And I'm seeing how many are in here. We did them, we do them for a year. So 50, 52, I think we do one a year. Yeah, 52 strategies of how, just use one. Just use one with your drivers. Just take one of the 52 and try it. Um, we found that drivers at ATS, for example, are, over engaged they can't get them to stop talking and so then you have carriers who are worried about whether well, they're going to say something wrong it's like well that's what you're there for so training them to be the coach you know they don't have to be the person that's all knowing like empower the drivers that motivates them right because they're they're seen as experts or they're seen as having knowledge and so that's what this book was really about was really helping the carriers taking the learning community approach in the research doing the research with the carriers and saying, look at how engaged your drivers are. Um, and we have those white papers on our website. If you're interested, I can send you those. But um, the research we found was unbelievable. And in fact, 
the one thing that's interesting that you'll find in the research, if you look at learning communities is where do the topics come from? A lot of times they come from the instructor. They're generated from the instructor. They come up with the topics. But what's really awesome about if you're in practice is having the drivers ask the drivers, what do you want to talk about? What's motivating to you? What are you seeing on the road? And they're going to come up with ideas that really build these rich learning communities. So it's learner and learner interactions that are really taken off. Um, it makes it makes it makes the safety directors uncomfortable, right? Because they think, oh no, it has to come from me. But the carriers that are doing it are seeing safer drivers. Their drivers, they have less incidents. And it's because of these other modalities of learning that they're employing at their organizations. So we have a, a point from Jennifer, a point from Christian. I'll just make a point before they go, is that you started a company based on all this consulting you were doing mm -hmm. uh, 20, 20, uh, almost 20 years ago, in fact, right? So mm -hmm. 15 to 20 years ago, you were doing so much. And the same was happening with me. I started a company called SurveyShare, which mm -hmm. I sold. I remember. I sold. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I also did consulting about how to teach online. But mm -hmm. that I haven't, I sold the company. I haven't. I don't get as many requests to teach people how to teach online because people know how to teach online today. And there's a lot, of, I have a free book, how to do that anyways. So you've expanded, I've retracted. Um, mm -hmm. I've gone back to, people were telling me, you just need to quit being a faculty member, just do all this consulting stuff. And I probably could have followed your mm -hmm. path, but I decided mm -hmm. not to. And so mm -hmm. instead I moved into the heavy on the research side and mm -hmm. the past 15 years, just, you know, doing heavy researches and, and all that. So, uh, you know, I've gotten a ton of stuff out in that mode, but it, your career ebbs and flows, you know, mm -hmm. do some mm -hmm. things for a certain part of the career, you do other things, another part of your career and go back and forth. Um, Jennifer or Christian, you want to jump in? Jennifer. I just was uh, saying that it sounded like that would be good for morale at any company to draw on the expertise of people who are already there, who've been working there a long time. <laughs> Definitely. And you think about it, most of the training in corporate ed or corporate world is, is learner to content. Like that's what it is. It's not learner to learner. It's, you know, it's learner to content. So there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, the research that I learned at IU, I've been able to employ and actually implement at organizations in the data we have. One of the interesting things that we just did with our new 2023 study was health and wellness for the drivers. As you can imagine, that's a huge topic. Drivers are on the road, they're not eating healthy, um, they're depressed, they're lonely, they're, you know, they're isolated. There's all these things. And for the wellness of, of the drivers, we wanted to reach out to the carriers and say, what strategies do you have? to really help with the motivation and well-being of the drivers. So we had four case studies from the clients that gave us ideas for our other clients, but also we asked drivers at the bottom of every e-nugget, there are micro lessons. We asked drivers to rate them. And so we get an aggregate rating of 400, over 420,000 drivers are rating these topics. And interestingly, and this goes back to the research that I learned it through my doctoral program as well in online learning, is that typically, obviously, instructors teach the topics they think is important, but not very often do they ask the learners to in, involve them into the learning and say, what would you like to learn today and have the learners drive that learning experience so there's a disconnect in our research, our findings that the carriers are assigning topics that are tied to the CSA or safety scores, which makes sense. But the drivers are asking for topics that we have like kindness topics and gratitude topics and being depressed and how to deal with relationship issues. And those aren't topics that the carriers necessarily are interested in. Um, and so that creates a challenge uh, because the drivers, it's over, it's 100%, um, what do I wanna say, like uh, in terms of retention, it's hard to keep drivers. They have 100% turnover at these organizations. And so we're helping, we're seeing if you focus on the health and wellness, again, Jennifer, making sense of your, of your learners or your employees that you can have better retention. Um, but interestingly, this isn't information or, or research that they're doing. Um, so to be able to get those analytics from your learners is really important and to, and to act on it. 
So if you can, if you can assess how your learners are learning and then what they want to learn, you can provide real time information to them so that they can learn and be engaged. Because we're adults, you can learn, there's learning everywhere, like open learning, like Dr. Bonk said, I mean, the resources are all there. And Jennifer, you said when I came on, like all the books are there. Uh, so what's the other element for learning that's going to connect you? Um, and that's really the missing piece in trucking. They don't have that. Gina, um, can I ask you a question real quick? Yeah, of course. Um, so uh, my uh, previous job, I, I was working towards becoming a like a building principal was what I was. Oh, working. I love that. Um, I, 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 it was exciting. It was fun. Um, but one of the, but, the, but the then he quit, right? So he quit. Oh, that's okay. I, I took a different route in education. <laughs> yeah. Just kidding. Um, but, uh, one of the things that I always wanted to do, um, was to, uh, like if I was in a principal role, it was to, to demonstrate the, the value that I had in my brand new teachers that are just coming out of the teacher mm -hmm. education program. And mm -hmm. I, I was trying to like brainstorm this, what this would look like, but I thought having those individuals that were fresh out of college, um, be the, the ones that would lead some of the professional learning, uh, in, inside of my building would mm -hmm. create like a sense of, um, uh, buy-in from them, uh, demonstrate their ability to to provide some leadership as well, even though they're the young uh, the young teachers coming in. But I, I was wondering what that that looks like then in like the trucking industry, because I I know that there's like trucking companies, but then there's also uh, schools that they would go to for the initial education. Would that be something that they would ever be able to bring in, and you be able to empower those those young uh, younger ones in the in the profession? Yeah, so there. Are, so to answer your question, there are truck driver training schools, and that's different than carriers. And a lot of carriers do partner with them. So you have to get to to get your CDL. You have to go through training in a truck before you go to a carrier. Um, and so there is a lot of that collaboration already. Um, but what's not collaborated is part of the building your company culture. So what you're really talking about is building a company culture and bringing that buy-in into an organization so that everybody everybody um, is on board with it. Because the risk that you take when doing that is, is merging those beliefs and those skill sets so that everybody buys in. Um, and so with the, with the online learning community aspect, you give kind of like a um, option of engagement and who wants to lead those discussions and who joins those discussions. So it's not forced like, like in the teacher situation, um, for example, it's like this person's going to lead and all of you are going to be part of this. Well, that's going to create some dissonance for some people because they're going to say, well, I know more than that person, you know, and so it's like, how do you create that culture so everybody is part of that? And part of the challenge in trucking is that everyone is so focused on not getting sued that that aspect of... Sorry. Right. Okay. Like <laughs> schools, like, well, with the, well, if you drive a truck in Texas, uh, the chances are there's going to be a series of lawyers that are going to come after you and try to, to take you to court as a trucking carrier. So there's a lot of people who are focused on that and not on the safety, overall safety. They're just trying to like prevent that from happening versus like building these cultures. And so, um, and, and there really isn't, while some carriers have collaborative efforts with different organizations, um, there's not a lot of that because there's a lot of competition between drivers and drivers skip jobs. Like they could be at one carrier at the beginning of the week and then a different carrier at the end of the week. So the resources are slim and you all want to have your food and everything. We all depend on the truck drivers for everything we do. And so there's a lot of competition. So you're balancing kind of the competition aspect with the collaborative aspect. But I think the best that we've seen and the most collaborative effort is when people are invited as an option to do that and letting them kind of evolve that environment together because you're gonna get drivers who are experienced that are collaborative with those younger drivers and but others that wanna be a mentor to those drivers. And so together you can kind of build that and that's what's really beautiful about the online learning communities because there is a lot of that safeness that they feel 
The drivers themselves, one of the only downside they thought about it was they have, a lot of them have spelling challenges. And so they don't wanna be embarrassed in those environments, but we have an audio recorder so they can record and they don't have to worry about typing. Um, but you know, all those considerations, but that is an interesting model that you had thought of. And um, I think there could have been a lot of success with it depending on how you implemented it. So Christian has a question. Yes. I'm collecting them now. <laughs> Just kidding. I have to write them down if I don't forget. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I think it's interesting. Um, you kind of touched on a little, little bit of it just there. Um, but it, talking about the competition that exists, do some of these carriers actually, um, like, are there any roadblocks you come into contact with, with the carriers that they don't want to share their leg up culture um, that they want to provide their, their drivers with? Yeah, so it's very interesting. So we have carriers, um, like we have a carrier that has like 11,000 trucks that we can't even share. We're working with them. Like there's a lot of protection about the resources that you're using to leverage up your services. Um, and so they definitely don't want to share. So it kind of reminds me a little bit about when I first started teaching teachers not wanting to share what they're doing in the classroom, like very protective, like close the door. This is what we're doing. And and um, it is a lot like that in trucking. There are some carriers that are willing uh, to collaborate. And you'll see that through our social media, like we're going to be releasing different carriers and say, yeah, why Luma? Why we use Luma? But there is a lot of that. Trucking is so vital right now. There's trucking companies going out of business um, a lot just because of the resources and the cost and everything going on in the economy. But there's a real opportunity to help those be successful. Um, and I think that's one of the things that's, uh, that I'm personally passionate about. And, um, you know, just trying to help those carriers build those connections and resources so they can be successful. They may not know, like want to know who else is using those, but to be able to recommend those, I think is always helpful. Were there already existing communities that you ended up uncovering at some points? Like I can imagine like unions, like the Teamsters probably had some level of communications that they would do, whether that was through some newsletter or something like that, um, that they would kind of share some, but yeah, uh, so, I, mm -hmm. you, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there's actually federal regulations. Um, the FNCSA puts regulations in place that dictate what drivers have to know. Um, so there are, you know, government agencies that, that actually dictate uh, those you know, there's a, a international road check that's coming up in May and drivers will be pulled over um, based on that and they'll have to have certain components done. And so, yeah, there are different groups. There's a lot of, like there's conferences and organizations in IST, like, like you know, the conference Dr. Bonk just got back from, like there's organizations like that. Every state has a trucking association that they can get free training and free resources from. Um, there's a lot of free resources from my perspective, a lot of the challenge is not presented in ways that people learn. And so that's yeah. really where that, there's a lot of overflow of information. Every cab of truck and most trucking carriers now have cameras inside, outside, all around. They don't, there's so much data and information, it's cognitive overload and they don't know what to do yeah. with it. So they need the partners to help them assimilate the information. And now you're talking about AI and Think about your cars you have in your car, like the little sign that comes up and says, hey, you you need coffee or put your hand on the wheel or whatever it's telling you to do if you have a newer car. I mean, those things are in the trucks too, but I mean, it's just so much information, but there are a lot of different resources in the industry that they can get that, get different um, information from for sure. Yeah. Yeah, you talked about very at, at the end of Bo's conversation, you and Bo's conversation, you talked about the safety of the learning environment that some of the that you were helping to create for some of those truck mm -hmm. drivers. Um, it, it's interesting. I, I guess I didn't realize just how um, free agent the drivers are. <laughs> yeah, um, I have I have and, these yeah. cards. I was going to go get some. I'm going to grab them. So we have these learning cards, for example. Nobody really knows. I'm going to go grab them right now. Mm -hmm. I scared you, should, you should you should see my you should see my office. I have this on my desk. Today's today's calendar. Uh, 
Dr. Bonk's uh, dog, and um, it's right on my desk. It's this little calendar here. Uh, motivation every day. It says the end of the run is rarely the end. It's just a part of a run and seldom is just the beginning. So Dr. Bonk's quotes every day. I have one taped to my desk. It's really good. But these are the these are um, my Lumify cards. And I made them like a deck. And I give them yeah. the truck. I give them the, the trucking carriers. Um, and they're they're 52 weeks. I did one every week. And so the idea is they're game-based cards because every the drivers like to be competitive and they like uh, to have competitions among each other. So we have different leaderboards and uh, opportunities to game base the instruction. So if they do it face-to-face, -face, so we're not an online learning company, we're a learning company. So they could do these in blended um, fashion. They could do them um, in classroom and there's some online strategies. But the idea is how do you create game-like approaches when you teach truck drivers to keep them engaged? And so this was our idea and we made them like a card deck uh, because they're in their truck and they can go through and the carriers can share them with them and give them little challenges and make learning fun. And that's why we have Nugget, our, our stuffed animal, he uh, or it can go on trip. And so <laughs> it goes goes around in the truck with the drivers and then they take pictures and they put them on our map, where in the world is Nugget? Uh, and so they have stories and scavenger hunts. And then uh, Nugget's best friend is Brush. And um, I'll show you Brush. Brush is a pretty cool brush. We created brush because we feel like the drivers were depressed. A lot of them said they, you know, were going through a lot. And so we send brush out when people need encouragement and they can pass brush on to somebody that they feel needs encouragement. And we get so much, so much love and like the drivers really appreciate it. And I know it's like, well, it's like a stuffed animal, but they put them on all over. They put them on their truck, you know, truck beds and Anyway, it's just it's it's a lot of goodness, you know. That's what it's about. So, do you have do you have truck drivers that don't that don't work with a carrier that you work with, wanting to be a part of your community, your learning community? Um. Yeah. So we have. <laughs> so we're we're a registered provider for the FNCSA. So anyone that's going to be a truck driver has to take a theory course, and they can take that through Luma. Um, they have to take the behind the wheel through actually somebody with a truck. We don't have semi trucks, but we have truck drivers that send us notes um, on our help ticket. Our help ticket's nugget at learnwithluma.com and they ask for nuggets and they ask for resources. Um, so they may not be with a carrier wow. or maybe they were with a carrier um, and they appreciate the, the resources we give them. Um, and especially they like to have fun and they they try to, to get free things for me, but that's fine. I just like, I like to help them. So that's learner directed, um, learner directed, um, or I guess learner agency there. <laughs> it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Our Facebook page, where in the world is nugget. Um, the drivers will follow that and share stories and, and so forth. But we have a carrier learning community. It's um, internal, you have to log into it, but they share pictures of their pets and um, all sorts of things. They have their favorite ice cream trucks. Our Canadian friends up in Canada, well, it's still snowing up there. They'll take a picture of the truck, like all covered in snow. And I don't know, it's just a lot of fun. You have to like connect with your, whoever your client is, right? You really have to build that authentic connection with them. And I think that's what it is. And I think that's why, um, well, I know that's why Dr. Bonk is so good at what he does and how he engages with his classes, because it's an authentic connection and just being authentic in what you do and how you want people to engage with learning is important because they pick up on that and they know that you care about what you're doing. Because at the end of the day, it's what their people are going to remember you by, right? So it's those Build connections. So, exactly. Good tie-in. That gets a bonus point, yeah. I think, right there. He gets a bonus <laughs> point for this class. He's so the both. TA. <laughs> oh, he's the TA. Oh, I see. Okay. So Bo or Xiaoying or Jennifer, you have a question? I'm okay right now. Jennifer? Um, 
I saw something on the news, I thought, not long ago about um, driving simulations that are supposed to help with the attention and, and your discussion earlier of um, the texting while driving made me think of that. And so I was wondering if that played a role in the training programs you develop or anything like that. Um, you had mentioned bringing in AI at some point and other technology. Yeah, so let me share with you. So the answer to the simulations, and let me tell you a little bit about the pros and cons in trucking. So they actually have physical simulation trucks that you can go in and practice. The good thing is you get to practice. The downside, it's not authentic, meaning that it's not the actual truck that you're going to be in, and it's not the actual environment that you're going to be in. And so when you think of authenticity, you really have to look at the actual place and and where you're going to be. Um, there are, at least it gets the practice in, and a lot of training schools, we use the simulators for that. We don't do v virtual reality. Um, the technology of the drivers of having to get the devices and everything would be just a lot. There are companies that do that, and it's it's quite expensive, and it, there is a barrier for the drivers. The technology isn't the most strong suit for the a lot of the drivers, um, but let me show you what we've done. We're and I'm going to share my screen. Let me know if my technology, I should be okay. I mean, I'm on a high speed internet. It's weird that. Um, so when we, when somebody um, works with Luma, this is um, an example. This is a send. They, they're okay with me sharing their um, platform. We make a copy of it and then they can tailor it. They get a copy. We have over a thousand e-nuggets or micro lessons, but again, we're a learning company, so they use them blended. They can use them online. They can use them in the classroom. Um, but we built this immersion tool. It's the first to the industry. Uh, you've seen it before. I mean, eLearning Brothers has a similar technology. If you use Lectora decades ago, I mean, that has a similar technology. We built it into our product, into our LMS, so that the trucking carriers can do immersive experiences without an additional technology. There isn't an LMS um, that currently does that unless you have a, an AI or a, um, API with a, with a Lectora, which was purchased by eLearning Brothers now at this point. Um, but if you go into this is an example of um, their technology that they built that is screen by screen that they can go in and look at and interact um, with the technology. And so the real cool thing about this is I, I had thought that they would use it for the technology in the truck, but what I'm finding is that they're using it for tours of their yard. So you can imagine before a driver even gets there that they're going out and taking, and all they need to create this is their cell phones. Um, and so what they do is they take their cell phones and they can go out and build these. And we made it so simple that in our technology, you can go to the back end and we have a content creation tool right here. We have all bunch of different types that we've built in here, but you can go in and they and we train them on how to do this. They can go in and build their own immersive learning. And so here are former truck drivers who don't have a lot of technology experience building their own immersive learning environments. This gives them empowerment to do this. And number two, you talk about simulations. Those are good, but being the, as close as you can be to the authentic environment is what is going to help the drivers really know how to perform in those environments. And so that has been really helpful for our, our clients to be able to have not a separate technology, but a technology that's built into our LMS that can help them build these environments. So before the drivers even come, they're building these out for all of their yards um, they can come in and this is something I saw with houses. You know, you don't ever have to go see a house anymore. You could just go online and look at the house. So why not replicate the technology and build it for the drivers so they can go in and do this. Um, and it is like really been awesome for the drivers because before they might have to watch a three hour video to be able to see this information, but now they can come in and they can earn points. Um, and then when they come back um, on their dashboard, you can see 
they're earning points and they can trade them in for merchandise. And we're actually integrated with Best Buy's catalog. Um, so they can trade it in for TV for their truck. And so you talk about external motivators. Um, internally, if they're internally motivated to do it is one thing, but now that they can earn their points, they can go to their user dashboards um, and they can start trading it in for different, this is their digital badges, but they can start earning um, different things. And one of our clients, they are in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and they can customize their company store. To, they have a meat store in Green Bay that they really like, the drivers really like. And so they can offer the meat store items like bratwurst. And so the drivers can go get bratwurst and stuff. And they love that. Um, but we can track time and how much time they've spent and their digital badges. They love earning their little digital badges. Some of our, look at one of our clients did. This is a, they took, they took our, this is a calendar they created. They created for, they had the kids color our coloring book. And then they took and they created this for their drivers. So we customize all the badges and then they talk about motivating. Um, and then they have all their, it's pretty cool. They, they uh, took our coloring book and then they created their company, company ca calendars off of it. So anyway, it's pretty cool. But um, yeah, so to answer your question about simulations, I got carried away. But I guess the point is like, to, for me, it's about being as authentic for the drivers as possible. You can create a simulation, but unless it's the actual environment, and I'm actually working with a neuroscience group who are studying the impacts of um, neuroscience on driver input of looking at technology, and then they can take those actual environments of the videos and issue training off of, which is pretty cool. So that's something we're working on. So I'll stop sharing. <clears throat> So that's great. I like the sharing. I really think that's beneficial for people to see it. We might have you go back to that before we close yet. And we don't mm -hmm. want to keep you too long. I, had, I do have some questions for you, though. Okay. Um, so go back to um, some things you mentioned earlier. You said you said you had so many truckers respond. I don't know if you said 460 or 4,000. 400. Or it's We had 400. 400,000. It was over 400,000. It was 400,200 drivers. 400,000. 400, no way. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. No one has 400,000 in a participants. You really yeah. had 400,000? Yeah. We have 400,000. Wait, <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We have Last what? month, I sent I sent out six hundred thousand emails. Oh, wait a minute! I have La that many drivers. Last week in this class, it was on ethics. You're supposed to be telling the truth. Really, that many? I can show you my I can show you my email <laughs> bill from last month. It was six hundred thousand. <laughs> over six hundred thousand emails went out wow. last week. Wow! We have over. Pretty soon, pretty soon, Doctor Bonk. Pretty soon, once I get the top ten trucking carriers, I'm gonna I'm gonna top it. But I'm going to get there. But yeah, okay. 400, it was 400,000. It was 400,200. And we okay. had, yeah. You said it really drivers. fast. I, I, that's why I didn't well, catch the exact it's number. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh. Wow. Wow. So you're dealing in big number, big data. I'm so, big data. That's my point. That's my point. Yeah. It's like, we know we have the information. That's my uh, point. Yes. Are you studying learning analytics to try and analyze that data? Yes. Yes. Do, do uh -huh. you hire people to help you oh. analyze that data? No, I don't hire people, but to, me and Scott analyze the data. Right. With all your growth, and you showed us yeah. the, the, the graphics that they, you know, mm -hmm. the Lumina cards or Luma cards and all that. Are you yeah. hiring other people to help you for for graphic design or what kind oh, of job? This week is yes. a week on jobs, and next week's oh, week on jobs. It. Last got week was it. ethics. So I'm trying Let to get at what you. job Tell opportunities me. are in the field I, here. Oh my gosh, you guys, if you want, if you want a job, if you want to work for Luma, if you're trying to get jobs, look at our website. I have, our team is small. We have 18 people on full-time employees. And then I contract with uh, subject matter experts. So I have about 25 subject matter experts because I'm, I'm not a trucking, a 
subject matter expert, but um, I, my director of art, Elizabeth has been with me 12 years. Mm. She came with me from global campus. I told her one day she would work for me and we'd work together, but she drew all the art for global campus. And um, I hired her. She's been with me. She had her 12 year anniversary last month. And so she's my longest employee. My second longest employee has been with us for five years. Um, he's our director of business development. He helps me sell. I'm hiring a new sales person. This, I have two interviews this week. I'm hiring two developers. Uh, I have four developers. Yeah. So, um, I will tell you this, there is a lot of job opportunity out there. Everyone is looking to hire that has a business. It's about finding a job that you're going to be passionate about and you want to contribute to, because it has to be, it's not a job. It has to be a passion because a job is just something you're gonna go do and not be that motivated about, but a passion is something that you can leave your legacy, right? And if if you find something that you are passionate about, then you gotta move on. You gotta find something you're passionate about. But yeah, Luma, Luma has grown since 2019, 222%. And the reason why I'm telling you this, and I know this, is because we've been nominated for a top 500 I Inc. award for the year of being one of the top growing companies in the com country. And so that is gonna be announced, I think in September, but we were nominated. And so I think the reason why we have such good growth is because of number one, I have a great team. Uh, we have a great product that's grounded in learning science from Indiana University and was, uh, you know, partly influenced by awesome people like Dr. Bonk. And number three, we're doing great things for an industry that really needs it. Do you have anybody working for you that is a recent alum of IST that I would know? No, nobody applies for my U. Okay. Well, you have to, we'll have to make sure we'll have to do better that way. Um, how, yeah. So a couple of things, could you read a couple cards from the deck of cards so we can get a sense of what oh. might be on the cards? And maybe I got to turn on my light. I'll okay. be right back. All right. I'll All be right. right back. Let me get the dark. And maybe also read a couple of um, uh, items from the building learning communities or the, the you know, yeah, sure. the, the 106 teaching tips. Maybe read a couple of those. It'd be good just to get examples. Yeah. So if you go to my website, basically what I did, and I'll send you this, um, I take, I, I, Put this uh, open so it's open and anyone can have access to it but then we produce it in a obviously like the deck of cards um so let me go to my gamify uh cards here let me do a search here i should see here here's my luma connection so these luma connections are all of the connections, I'll put them in the um, chat box here that we provide uh, to our clients. Um, and so for example, pass the torch is an example. So, um, so obviously collaboration is important for our social emotional well-being. Um, and so we produce this uh, research white paper on building learning communities. And so pass the torch is an idea where you present a discussion topic and give learners adequate time to think about it. And then the first person to respond um, can respond to it and then say Pat, they pass the torch to someone else uh, to respond. And then you can keep that collaboration or community going um, so that you each pass, pass the torch. And this was really interesting. One of our clients did this in person and then they had so much fun actually passing. Uh, they actually had Nugget and they threw Nugget back and forth to pass the torch. And they, they, it was a really great way to engage everyone. So somebody wasn't passively sitting there and being part, not part of the community. Um, and so that was uh, really, so I trademarked Lumify. Um, that's what I call the cards. And so each of these, I'll do fill the cup. I'll put those in there. Um, so fill the cup is a kindness uh, example. Um, and so the idea for fill the cup is that 
um, you can put an image of a cup uh, and have it be where your learners, you could post it in an online discussion board um, and they download it and you could all draw something about another driver or a colleague about something kind about their community or about a driver or just about anything that you would want to spread the world um, in a kindness way. And then they can take a picture of that cup and share it with their learning community um, and be recognized at a banquet at the end of the year. And so that's really what these, one of our clients did, they didn't do cups, but they shared ideas of how to spread kindness around their organization. Um, and that was one of the cards. And it's actually the last card on the deck. And so all of those are free. I always do. I follow suit of Dr. Bonk and the world is open. Uh, everything is open and free. Um, and then I print them out and send them to pros prospect clients or drivers because some of them like to hold. They don't not very technical, so they like to have it in their hands. The 106 teaching tips are on here too that I am selling at Amazon. Um, and the learning lessons. There's more context uh, in the book. I actually provide a framework. It's my E2A model, um, not the R2D2 model, but it's the E2A model. And um, there is those uh, lear learning lessons and there's 106. I actually wrote it before COVID. And then I decided that right around COVID, it was 2021, I created them as a book because people in my neighborhood who had never taught before, were having to teach their kids and they needed ideas for how to teach them. So I provided a blended and online learning tip for each lesson that they could take back um, and apply to any content. The content is written for trucking, but they could take it and use it in any context. Um, and so if you go to my blog, uh, you can see it. This, this year, um, if you go to our LinkedIn page once a month or once a week, we're releasing new content and around a different framework. Um, and so you'll see that if you, we're doing blended learning strategies this year. So we're on week 34. And so um, each idea comes with a little, it's, it's um, grounded to the E2A model, which is efficiency, engagement, and authenticity. Um, and then we have a framework. I created a framework of what it means within a context. And so, kind of like what framework it would be in. And so they have that for each of the lessons. Um, but they really, we've gotten a lot, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from the, the industry of these are really helpful to them because a lot of them have never taught. All this so, is wonderful, Gina. I mean, it really is. Uh, but I have four uh, questions, at least three uh, for you. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat how people earn points? Is it completion of a module? Is it completion of, of, of a, a lesson? How do people earn points? Yeah, let me show you really quickly. So um, I'm gonna go into one of our clients that allows me to share. So you can earn points in Luma through a lot of variety of things. Uh, assessment points um, is one way. Uh, they can earn them through participation points. So we have a timer if they need to stay on uh, through comments and through liking, which I'll show you that. And um, they can also attend a live session. So we built a synchronous technology in our platform. They can attend a live session. And if they get, um, they are in the access log, they can get points. Um, but under here and um, under the setup, there's a point administration. So you can actually go in and award points um, for other things too. So some of our clients will give points if somebody, they have these safety scores and if they're safe for the entire week, you can go in and manually add points. And if you are late for orientation or something like that, you can take away points. And so like this, learner right here has 141,000 points. Um, and again, they can automatically earn points for doing the things in Luma. So for example, at the bottom of every e-nugget, this is a high winds e-nugget, they can earn points and these are all, they can customize these. 
Um, and then at the bottom of every e-nugget, they can leave, go down here. They can leave a comment uh, or leave feedback. And this, this can be anonymous or not, but they can leave feedback and comments um, and they can earn points for that too. So there's a lot of flexibility in terms of how the learners use points but or earn points. But what we tell carriers when we go through the onboarding process with them is that they have to be very deliberate in communicating what their point plan is, because if not, the drivers, and they can reset the leaderboards in here too, the drivers will uh, bug them or bug us um, about, and I don't know if they're, yeah, they're not resetting theirs, but they can reset their leaderboards. They would be bugging us about how they're going to get their points, especially when they can trade it in for Best Buy merchandise. That's a good question. That's wonderful. Um, so you just showed us a whole bunch of different motivational techniques, right? Throughout mm -hmm. the last 20 minutes, the digital badges relate back to extrinsic motivation. But again, like I talked about earlier, it's intrinsic as well. So, you know, a, a lot of the gamification of instruction. Well, if you're fostering curiosity, if you're fostering, you know, self-reflection and, and other things, then it's intrinsic. But, you know, if you're gamifying to get people to, to achieve and to move higher on the leaderboard, you know, above someone else or their previous point collection, then it's extrinsic in some ways. So, you know, a lot of this is intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, both. Gina, I was just looking at your guys's website, and um, you've got um, uh, two distinct different um, uh, options here under your menu uh, with transportation and education. Yes. Um, are you still providing like uh, like uh, I guess what we would refer to as like you know traditional educational services as a separate uh, piece of this, and then the the transportation services as well. So I'm not actively going out and seeking business and education, but because I had done so much consulting and higher education, I have clients that have been my clients for decades that are like Notre Dame is still a client, um, Illinois, like they're still clients I have. Mm -hmm. uh, we did recently partner with the Honeybee Foundation. They're a kindness uh, organization, and we developed a ki whole kindness curriculum for them. And that is available on our website for K-12 uh, and adult learning for the kindness curriculum. Um, but we don't actively, I don't have a sales associate going out and actively selling that. So you really need to have a sales associate associated with products you're going to sell to help you grow it. And um, we're not actively selling education, but I won't, I don't, we don't turn people away if, if it's, you know, business makes business sense for us. Mm -hmm. I gotcha. So, you know, you've got cards, you've got books, you've mm -hmm. developed all these apps. And I, I've developed apps or software, and mm -hmm. somebody it takes a lot of beta testing. There's no, there's no, no tool built the first time is ever the final version of that tool. And you've got a number of these tools, just the, the, the menu driven options that you show people. Well, you have to build the tools that, that fit with each one of the menu options. You've got cards, you've got simulations, you've got lesson plans and training and all this stuff. Um, that's a lot for a relatively young company, you know, to, to have your fingers kind of in a, lot, in a number of different places. Uh, what's enabled you to mm, provide so many different services in such a short amount of time? Um, and, and at a very creative level, you're not do, doing cookie cutter kinds of stuff, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's not you. You're not cookie cutter, mm -hmm. but I mean, eventually some of the stuff does become, I mean, you, you got to have that because mm -hmm. companies want to replicate some things. You don't want to continually build something new and have, you know, have something that's reusable, but in other ways, or you'd be going crazy nuts. Uh, so, so tell us about your philosophy of, um, you know, running a company like that, a small company, successful small company that's always growing somewhat and always, you know, uh, seeking some some new creative slant on to to outdo the competition, mm -hmm. uh, and how you're able to to, yeah. to do that so successfully and be nimble, um, and but you know and and how you can fund all these different initiatives because it takes some, you know, programmers cost money, you know. Um, yeah, so for us, we bootstrapped it um, basically 
you know, for us, like we decided that it was something that we were passionate about. And, um, you know, it takes a lot of time. It's like, we work a lot and, you know, one of the things that we're doing is replicating ourselves. And so the first step is thinking about what partnerships that you need in place to make this happen. I mean, we started our company in 2008. So this isn't something that was started yesterday. We started in trucking in 2014. And again, it took that person knocking on our door saying, hey, do you want to try this? And since 2014, I mean, that's almost 10 years. I mean, that's like a long time, um, you know, to, to be doing this. And one of the big things is listening to your customers and always being at the pulse of what your customers need. We're always getting ongoing feedback in our system. As you saw, every Sunday night, we get a report from the drivers and we get a report uh, what they like and what they don't like in, um, in our clients. And, you know, taking that information in and building technology. I partnered with Scott. He's actually my husband, but we used to debate when I was at the IU program, he was getting his PhD in engineering mm -hmm. at uh, Illinois University. And we used to debate of how he was taught isn't how people learn. And so we would debate hours and hours. So it's having a partner that like, you don't have to be married to them, but like somebody that, you know, you can like brainstorm ideas off of and create it together. You can't do anything alone. If you look at my LinkedIn page, it says together we're better because nothing that we can do. I can't draw a nugget. I, I found somebody that I could work with that could do that for me. And so she was a contractor for me for a, a while um, until we had enough funding and you know, as you get more funding and you are able to fund more things, we just reinvest back into our company. Um, myself personally, I grew up with nothing really pretty much. And so for us, you know, it's just taking a risk and a leap and um, just doing good things for people. And it seems that so far, you know, just kind of being in partnering with good people that you can trust. And that's the big thing is like, talking and learning from um, different people and observing how people do different things that you think that are, like you said, ethical and, and, and right and just kind of going. So for us, it was about collaborating, Scott and I collaborating together. I can't, I can program a little bit. I mean, I build websites, but not to the capacity, like you need this kind of engineering um, to be able to do what you want to do. And we piloted it. We piloted our program with a payroll company initially. And on a drive home, we were like, man, we should like take what we're doing with them and build a tool that we could do more with. And we built it. And then we, we sold, we just started, we went after like all these RFPs and we kept losing and you just got to be persistent. We just kept losing them and losing them and trying to partner with Notre Dame and Finally, we said, we have, we think we have something really cool. Let's just see if we can sell it and get feedback and improve it. And that's kind of how we did it. I mean, honestly, yeah. it's with the people that you, you collaborate with really. So why don't you stop the share, uh, share screen here. Um, and I have two last questions then. You kind of answered the first one already. I, you know, I have the calendar on leadership, learning and life. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I want to steal a few things for you for my next calendar. Can you tell us uh, two or three or four of your leadership principles of running a company as from yes. an, as a, you know as someone a grad in instructional systems technology you know I would say my number one leadership principle would be that again together together is you know we're better because really if you invest in the people around you and you authentically do that and it comes from a place of of honesty um, and, and they know that you're supporting them, that, that together you'll be able to build something pretty amazing. Um, and you know, the CEO of Best Buy, who's no longer, it was one of his core principles. And I actually read his book. Um, and to me, it's the foundation of, of relationships and, and, and how we connect with people is really what makes you successful in my mind and what I've experienced. Um, and, I read his book and I was like, I should have written that book. Uh, I had this, um, this little, I'm sure you've heard of Simon Sinek. 
this little book. Uh -huh. uh, so like this is a great book to have. The author again is? Simon Sinek. Thank you. This is a great book to and have. It's right on my bookshelf. And he's from Best Buy? No, this isn't Best Buy. Okay. Uh, I'll send you the book. Um, I have to find it, but I, I'll, I'll send you the title of it because I don't know off the top of my head. I actually bought the book for a whole organization because to me, the foundational principle of, you know, people and working with people and being authentic is, is key because to alone, you only can get so far. So uh, Christian is writing all these links down and all these items down. He will send to the students in this class. Most of them are not here in the live meeting, but they'll read his email after this. So we'll get that. Um, I wanted to ask you one question. I want to sneak in one more. Um, since this is all, you know, kind of learning theories, instructional theories, which, which learning slash instructional design principles do you think are the some key things to help people learn? Which, what, what, what do you think if you had to list your principles uh, of learning? Yeah. What would they be? So I've kind of boiled them down to the framework, the E2A model, which is efficiency. Um, and so really thinking about how you structure information in a succinct and efficient way is, is really important. Um, authenticity, uh, you know, in terms of really making the learning very specific and authentic to that particular learning culture. So you talk about social culture learning. I mean, really looking at that particular culture, I can tell you that how we train nurses is very different than how we train drivers. Um, so I really believe the culture and specifically the environment is important. And then the third uh, principle um, is engagement and really looking at theories of engagement and how we engage learners um, into the learning to begin with, because learning, the first step is to get someone's attention. And so when you talk about adult learning, what principles do we use for, for getting their attention to learn and what motivational theories? And so those are like the big keywords, I would say, and a combination of those is what we've structured our, our learning and environment on. Okay, so I'll end with this. All that you've done in the past 15 years or so, 20 years, pretty amazing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and you've you've learned a lot and and you've you know some has been tinkering, some has been beyond well beyond tinkering with the process. What's next? If looking in your, yeah. your crystal ball for you and for you and for the company, what's next? So I would say for the company, um, for this year, 2023, one of the main things that we're going to be working on is looking at automated and differentiating instruction for drivers based on their neuroscience and cognitive ability. And so you, utilizing AI uh, specifically to automate, differentiated learning has been around for, you know, 20, 30 years. I mean, it's been around for, you know, Car Carol Thomason, you know, decades has been discussing this. and um, it's something that's been done, but not done well. And I think we're at the point where we can di really differentiate learning experiences, not based on what we think drivers know based on assessments, but by how their brains work. Um, and I think we're close to it. And so that's something that I'm really excited about for this year. And it's well beyond, well, like advanced than any of our competitors because they're doing videos. Um, and so that's really exciting for the company because Luma is bigger than me. Um, it's bigger than Scott. Like for us, like I, I have an exit strategy. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to do it forever. There's always something else to do. And I think it's just a matter of, you know, when is that exit strategy going to be employed? And for me, it's important that the company's in a place that can run without me or Scott, you know, because we want the, the company to be a legacy you know, be something that can help drivers for decades to come. And, you know, I think that that's important to both of us. What about when selfless, self-driving trucks ha happen? Who are you training then? So really the self-driving trucks um, are already happening. Um, but right now for Luma, we train more than just drivers. So we train employees, um, we train organizations. So we train warehouse workers, we train dock workers. They're still gonna have to be people that are coaches of the truck um, that are 
still involved in the truck. It's very early in pilot and those won't replace all drivers. It's just kind of like when people talked about with online learning, replacing teachers, right? It's kind of the same kind of philosophy, like replacing teachers, uh, it's not gonna happen. Um, drivers, there's always gonna be drivers at some level. Uh, Amazon isn't gonna replace all their drivers. Um, and so, but there are gonna be different training opportunities that happen with automation and how you take care of those vehicles and what kind of maintenance they have and so forth. So there's a lot of opportunity that comes with automated trucks and electric trucks. That's just, that's happening already. We have two fleets that are fully electric right now. So does anyone have a final comment for tonight? Oh, I hope I didn't bore y'all. It was so good talking to you. And if you want to connect with me, certainly do that. Xiaoying, you want to say something um, before she goes, Xiaoying? No, no, no. Yeah, Gina shares a lot. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Christian? Um, Gina, I want to make sure I captured your model uh, correctly. So I have efficiency. I think the middle one's wrong. Um, authenticity and engagement. It's the middle one. Yeah, that's it. That's it. You got Is it? it. Okay. Yeah, you got cool. it. <laughs> Thank you. There were so many things that you talked about that were amazing. But you called it not A E E. It's E two E. Yeah, E two A. I just said I'm out of order. E two. What does the two stand for? The two E's. There's two E's. Oh, E2. It's like, D, it's like E2, D2, R2, okay. D2, uh, or whatever, R2. you know? It's like T. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah, okay. I can <laughs> get, get with the program. So, you know, it's been really wonderful to have you come in. There's a Thank last, you so last, much. Last minute, because you are not in the, you know, if you, you saw the syllabus, your name is not in there. But in many ways, you are, one, you know, really, really one of the best fits for the week that we've had. It's about job opportunities. And I did things on motivation and, you know, this is awesome. a wrap up, you know, this is a final second last week. And so they've read a lot of things, which leads them to all these learning principles. It leads them to think about how to apply, you know, the instructional design in action and where, what are companies doing, actually doing out there in the real world. Mm -hmm. you know, we've heard a lot from higher ed people in this class, but it's good to see someone who's in the corporate space. Uh, and higher mm -hmm. ed space who's taken mm -hmm. you know has a real foothold on on what's going on and you know and gamifying things and digital badging is alive and well throughout society now it's all about micro credentials so mm -hmm. it's it's not just about this class it's about societal changes in in learning and instruction which are embedded in the products and and, and that you're producing and contents that you're creating and the resources that you're providing it's all that and the, the leadership. That's why I wanted to talk about leadership and creativity, you know, and, and your passion for what you, it is that you're doing. So, you know, it's, it's just great to see examples. And so a big round of applause for you tonight. Thank you. Ah, uh, well, thank you for having yeah. me. And I really appreciate and I wish you all the best luck in all your schooling and you're under great mentorship with Dr. Bonk. He is an uh, amazing learning theorist and, and mentor and teacher and all the stuff he's done. And so anyway, I really appreciate being invited tonight. And I thank you. I'm glad the plane got me here. <laughs> it was a little <laughs> dicey last night, but I jumped on an earlier flight instead of getting home at 4.30 or 5 in the morning. Oh. I got home at quarter after 11 last night. So it, it made a big oh. difference. Just a few minutes made in being able to get on that earlier flight because my flight would have been disaster, I think. It was bad enough driving in the rain as it was. So I'm going to stop the recording for week 14, part two. Um, and we'll come back for part three in a couple of minutes. So stopping it there. Thanks, Gina. Bye, everyone. Bye.